Good afternoon. I think uh, <laughs> we will get, get started. Um, it's, it's impossible uh, to avoid in our society the realization uh, that uh, overdosing on almost everything uh, causes profound uh, psychological and physical uh, effects. Uh, it seems to me every day I look in the newspaper, there's something about marijuana or prescription drugs or what we may think of as old fashioned but always recurring uh, addiction. And uh, the Obesity issue lends itself to uh, also why why does it happen? Uh, how does it happen? And what can you do about it? Um, so today we're going to have an opportunity to learn from two leading thinkers and scientists in this area. But sort of in preparation, I, I don't know, suddenly it went through my head this part of this old poem uh, by William Ernest Henley, which I think we had to memorize in school because we were taught that we were the masters of our fate and we were the captains of our soul. Um, is that true? Uh, are we in control? And for that matter, what what is control? Um, the cognitive psychologists have defined control over, I don't know, probably a period of 50 or more, 100 years. But can control be described in uh, anatomic, uh, cell physiologic, molecular, genetic terms? Uh, we're going to learn about that today. But are we in control? And if so, how do we maintain control, whether it's drugs, food, habits? And for that matter, what's the difference between addiction and habituation? Uh, newspapers throw these terms around with great abandon, as do some social scientists. Is there a basis for this and from a neuroscience perspective? And more importantly, how do we lose control? over drugs, food, and habits. Uh, are rewards compensatory for control? Or do they lead us to lose control? And I guess we all wonder whether the mechanisms underneath all this from a cellular and neurophysiologic uh, basis are the same, you know, whether it's drugs, foods, and habits. And I guess the huge question for society, aside from trying to prevent loss of control, is once it's lost, is it possible to regain it? And where do we stand with regard to that? And I guess at the bottom of it all is, was Henley right? Are we masters of our faith? Are we captains of our soul? Well, enough of me. So today, we're really extraordinarily privileged to have two, not only uh, leaders in, in their field, but uh, globally uh, recognized as such. So uh, Nora Volkoff, I'm sure is known to all, but for the few of you who are perhaps new students here, uh, she received her medical degree from the National University of Mexico and then trained in psychiatry at New York University, and then went to the Department of Energy Brookhaven National Laboratory, which is out on Long Island, where she was director of nuclear medicine and really transitioned into an area in which she was one of the real first explorers, if not discoverers, and that is in the use of brain imaging to try and understand addiction. And she's probably one of, she's certainly one of the 
major forces in the globe for defining addiction as a brain disease and not as, as something else. Uh, in 2003, Dora became the director of the National Institute of Drug Addiction. And I find it interesting that the mandate of NIDA is to support most of the world research on health aspects of drug abuse and addiction. The world, this is not just Bethesda. And the world has recognized her in incredible ways. And uh, I, I'm, I, I always feel uh, chagrined when I've introduced her on several occasions, but to note that uh, Time Magazine described her as amongst the top 100 people who shape our world. And Newsweek said she's one of the 20 people you want to watch, more so than other events to occur later this week. Uh, Washington Tonian said she's amongst the 100 most powerful women. I thought my wife was, but... Uh, <laughs> And more recently, uh, U.S. News and World Report described her as one of the as the innovator of the year. You've probably seen her on CBS or an amazing TED Med uh, conference, which is on the website. So we're really honored that Nora, who's rather busy, as you can imagine, um, is going to uh, speak to us today about addiction, her work, and other things that will come about, and relationship to the other theme here, uh, which is related to uh, obesity and uh, call it compulsion, habituation. I'm not sure what the correct term is, or maybe it's addiction. At any rate, Kevin Hall, who is our second speaker, uh, graduated with a degree in physics. Uh, from McGill. And there, uh, he was interested in uh, nonlinear uh, analyses of biological uh, processes, and he has extended that into the field of metabolism, regulation of food intake, and body weight. And his laboratory, he's a senior investigator, uh, in the Integrative Physiology section of NIDDK. And his work has attracted global attention because he links studies in animals and in humans to uh, nutrient metabolism. Uh, from a layman's perspective, sometimes boils down to, why can't I lose weight? Well. You're going to learn something about it if you uh, have not thought of it before. And Kevin's work is also highly recognized most recently by the award, the E.V. McCollum Award of the American Society for Nutrition, which is given to a clinical investigator who is perceived as a major creative force generating new concepts in nutrition and personally seeing in the execution of these type studies. So we're extremely grateful to both of you. We're fortunate to be literally on the front lines. So Nora, would you speak first, please? Thanks very much for inviting me to speak uh, today. And actually, it's a pleasure to be here with, with Kevin. And to your question of, uh, can we, is Kenley correct or not? My perspective on something like that, are we in control or not? I think it's better to say and believe that we are in control whether we are on it or not. Because if we are not, there's nothing much we can do. And if we believe we are, we're much more likely to have an impact on our behaviors. So I'm going to actually um, uh, give a presentation that it is the result of a series of brain imaging studies that we did at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And my colleague, Dr. Jin Jack Wang, who's sitting in the back, and I'm actually putting him in the spot, has been instrumental and, um, and we've collaborated on this effort for many, many, many years. The, 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 these studies, which I'm going to be bringing forward, uh, was what led us to conceptualize many years ago 
that obesity, in a way, could be a result of addiction to food. And this generated an enormous amount of controversy because people were saying that's an oversimplification of uh, the me mechanisms that lead us for eating that ultimately can result in obesity. And they say, well, if you don't have leptin, for example, you're going to become obese, and that's not addiction itself. But as uh, research has going on, and we have started to understand much better the relationship between the mechanisms that are regulating our nutritional needs in the body and the mechanisms that regulate the regarding properties of drugs and food, we've started to identify many, many commonalities. And just on a simplified version, in the case of drugs, effectively, drugs are much easier than food, and understanding the neurobiology of drugs is uh, much simpler because drugs, all of them, whether it's legal or illegal, um, have their reinforcing effects. Uh, we want them because they activate the dopamine reward system. So the dopamine reward system is a mechanism very, very primitive that emerged uh, millions of years ago, actually, in very, very primitive organisms. You can see dopamine. And it signals as a molecule that drives our motivation to do behaviors that are necessary for survival. So this dopamine system, uh, how does the, the biology generate um, an incentive for an organism to do something that's needed for survival? Well, you can link it either with a pleasurable response, so you can seek it out, or you can link it with an aversive response, so you can avoid it. And that is signaled through this famous dopamine reward system. On the other hand, we know that uh, the regulation of food has a component that is clearly linked with, with reward. A food can be incredibly, uh, incredibly pleasurable. And actually, if you think about a chocolate, for example, and, and there are multiple neurotransmitters that are engaged in understanding those rewarding effects, but dopamine is fundamental. So if you actually damage dopamine cell systems in an animal, they cannot only perceive food as rewarding. But there are many, there's a myriad of peripheral signals that actually um, communicate the physiological state of the body and uh, motivate, actually, our needs for food. Some of them are um, peptides and hormones that are producing peripheral organs, such as ghrelin, which is produced in the stomach and, and the intestine, leptin, which is produced by fat, uh, fat cells, uh, insulin, which is produced by the pancreas and it's sensing the amount of sugar, are, or actually uh, we, we also have the other major homeostatic organ in our body is the hypothalamus. And again, the hypothalamus produces a series of peptides and neurotransmitters that modulate uh, hunger and satiety sing signals in the brain. But as we go into understanding how these peptides or hormones ultimately influence uh, you're sending this physiological sense that you don't have enough uh, sugar or you need more sugar, or you have too much fat and you need less fat. All of these systems are being signaled in central into the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus, what does it do with that? Well, it has to energize the brain to actually, if you need a nutrient, go and motivate the creature to go and get it. That's exactly where the dopamine system comes into play. And or alternatively, if you already have excess food, to basically inhibit the motivation to go seek the food, and that allows you to use your behavior to focus into something else. So what it has become very clear is whether it is directly through its rewarding effects that can be very pleasurable by palatability, or indirectly by nutritional needs that dopamine system gets engaged. And now there's an enormous amount of work that has emerged, I would say, over the past five years that has identified how these um, nuclei within the hypothalamus directly stimulate uh, the VTA dopamine cells in the reward center and or the nucleus accumbens. So now we know that yes, things like insulin have insulin receptors they are in the dopamine cells. Leptin, there are leptin receptors in the dopamine cells. And in, in turn, what we have also started to learn is that these molecules, these peptides, such as leptin, and ghrelin also modulate the rewarding effects of drugs, which is not surprising because these hormones are stimulating the dopamine system, which is ultimately what activates the rewarding effects of drugs. 
And if you think about it biologically, um, in terms of why do we have the dopamine system? We have the dopamine system not for us to take drugs and feel great and high, but we have the dopamine system to ensure that we do behaviors that are necessary for survival. And feeding is one of the most fundamental one of those behaviors. And so the behaviors that actually are needed to keep that going is through the dopamine system. So therefore, one would say is not that uh, food produces addiction, but actually that drugs are hijacking a system that was developed by nature specifically to motivate behavior, to create habits. And, and because drugs have several characteristics that can make them distinct in terms of their effects on the dopamine system from those of food, they can more rapidly generate habits that are very difficult to break. And, so it's, uh, and they also can result in compulsive uh, behaviors much more rapidly with food. But as we all know, uh, there is also in certain instances and in, with animal models, we can generate similarly compulsive patterns of food consumption in animals. And you also see it in, in humans with certain, with certain elements of uh, what is called highly rewarding food, food high in sugar, fat, and salt combination. Those are, are, are combinations that can trigger very rapidly these compulsive patterns of food consumption in a, uh, almost in any one of us. So what we know in, from uh, animal studies is that all of the drugs, uh, whether legal or illegal, increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. They do it by different mechanisms, nicotine by activating nicotine receptors, uh, heroin by activating mu opioid receptors, cocaine by blocking dopamine transporters. But they all have the same common element. They raise dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. Interestingly, food also increases dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And what's really elegant about the studies that were first done with food is that the magnitude of this increase in dopamine actually can be used to predict how hard the animal is going to be willing to actually uh, work in order to get that particular stimuli of food. And when the animal has eaten a lot of food, then the food can no longer increase dopamine. And that actually um, stops the drive and motivation of the animal to take the, the food. With drugs, the difference is that they are much more potent than food in increasing dopamine. The effects are not just of a higher amplitude, but they are longer duration. And different from what you see with food, that you satiate when you've eaten sufficient quantities in food in general, in the case of drugs, you can keep on giving the drug, and the drug pharmacologically will stimulate dopamine release. And this is the reason why also it is uh, much um, more likely that you can generate um, a model where an animal loses control much more rapidly with drugs than with food. We have used imaging actually to try to understand the, the role of the dopamine system in reward for foods and in reward for drugs to try to investigate if in fact there are commonalities between the condition of obesity and the condition of drug addiction. And the way that we measure dopamine in the human brain is indirect using imaging technologies, positron emission tomography, which relies on, the, in this case, the, one, the most frequently utilized methodology is the use of C11 raclopride, which is a, a ligand that binds to dopamine receptors, the type 2, and that is important. If you ask the question why, is that important? Uh, dopamine receptors type 2 only when these receptors are not occupied by dopamine. So under normal conditions, and this thing is dying on me, under normal conditions, these receptors are, most of them, you have 85% of those receptors available. So you can uh, give raclopride and you see the binding of raclopride. But if you increase dopamine in the synapse, in the extracellular space, dopamine binds to them and then raclopride no longer can bind. And so you can then give drugs, in this case methylphenidate, which increase dopamine, and observe the diminution in binding, which reflects the fact that that drug increases dopamine. And using this technique, for example, we and many others have shown that the magnitude of the changes in dopamine produced by drugs of abuse is directly associated with a subjective perception of reward. Um, the greater the increases in dopamine, the more intense the reward. So based on that, we had postulated, and, and this had been hypothesized before for many years in the world of psychiatry, that people were addicted to drugs because in them, the ability of drugs to increase dopamine was greater than in non-addicted persons, and therefore it was much more reinforcing. 
So we were very interested to determine, and actually we did believe, I did believe that that was correct. So we tested that hypothesis, and to our major surprise, we find that that's not the case. In fact, it's exactly opposite. This is the first study that we published in 1997, in which actually we showed uh, this is a normal person, and with methylphenidate, um, placebo and methylphenidate, you can see that decreases in binding in the areas where you have the dopamine D2 receptors because dopamine went up. But imagine our surprise when we were looking at cocaine abusers and the images between placebo and methylphenidate actually look very, very similar. And you can then go ahead and quantify. And in this first study, which we did many, many years ago, which was admitting patients in the hospital to ensure that they were not taking any drugs, testing them at least six weeks after they've been detoxified, we observed that the magnitude of the changes in dopamine, as assessed with this methodology, was at least half of that of the normal controls. So the hypothesis that they had a sensitized response as it relates to dopamine increases was not correct. In fact, it was the opposite. We went on to demonstrate that this is not just observed in cocaine abusers. It's also very markedly reduced in alcoholic subjects. And we went on to actually compare these same responses in active cocaine abusers, and again, shown consistently that there is a marked suppression of the ability of the drug to increase dopamine in the brain of the person that's addicted. That is, when they consume the drug, even though they are addicted to it, the ability of that drug to increase dopamine is markedly attenuated. And again, this was a big surprise, antithetical to any hypothesis anyone would have had. So then we went to ask the same question, and actually this is a more recent study that uh, we published uh, uh, last in 2014, in which we actually were looking at that same question in obesity. So in obesity, do we also see, because in, also that had been hypothesized at one point, that in an obese person there's a sensitized response to the rewarding dopamine enhancing effects of food in obese individuals. So we tested the hypothesis also using raclopride, but what this study did was actually comparing the contrast between um, glucose and sucralose. Sucralose provides the flavor and the palatability of sugar, but it has no calories. So we were interested, of course, in controlling the amount of calories as the relevant variable as it relates to its ability to increase dopamine in the, in, in the striatal brain regions. And by the way, from animal studies, it is now known directly that glucose, if you put glucose in the nucleus accumbens, you can actually increase dopamine. So glucose itself can enhance dopamine. But we wanted to actually investigate if that was in any way modified in people that were obese. So we studied the changes in raclopride under these two conditions, which are basically identifying when you have calories, whether you see an increase in dopamine in the striatal brain regions. So, and what it shows is that uh, the numbers that are negative means that there is a decrease in the raclopride binding. Ergo, that means that dopamine has increased in those individuals. And what was very interesting and published by Jin Jiaquang is that individuals with very low body max index actually have the increases in dopamine that are expected when you consume the calorie. But in contrast, actually, and again, uh, those individuals that were obese showed not only that they did not increase dopamine, but in some instances, they were observing a decrease in dopamine when they consumed the food. Identifying a similar disruption in the signaling with the consumption of reward in addiction for the drug, consumption of the drug is uh, that dopamine is attenuated, and in an obese person, consumption of the calorie has an attenuated dopaminergic response. So when you have data like this one, you say, well, what the hell is going on? If, if the literature is correct, and that is a very, very consistent finding that for a drug to be rewarding, it has to increase dopamine, then how do you explain this, what is happening in people that are addicted or in obese? Why would they even bother to take the drugs or the food if it's not enhancing dopamine? And that's where basically turning the page of uh, what dopamine really does um, has been very, very illuminating. And what has been shown actually is uh, 
work by, by Schulz, for many, many years, we believe dopamine signals is reward. So dopamine goes up, it's reward. But what Schulz showed was something fascinating. When you encounter a reward that's unexpected, it's the first time you encounter it, you consume it like the banana. And it's very, very rewarding, dopamine goes up. But as you get repeatedly exposed to that same stimuli, the banana, you stop increasing dopamine when you eat it. But instead, you increase dopamine when you see at the distance the jello of the banana. In other words, the repeated administration of the reward creates an associative learning memory that's mediated by dopamine. So for this memory to occur, dopamine has to go up actually very sharply. And then you create this memory that we call conditioning. And that Pavlov studied many, many years ago. It's exactly what made his animals, his dogs, salivate when they heard the sound that in the past had been repeatedly paired with the meat. But with repeated administrations, the animals started to salivate just with the sound of the bell. And that was uh, a transformative understanding of motivation and drive and how the dopamine system works. Pavlov didn't know that this was dopaminergic, but after Schulz actually encountered this, this very important role of dopamine in enable us to condition ourselves without have to understand why things that were difficult to understand actually occur. And so this is a study that was evaluating a Pavlov-like experiment, but with cocaine, instead of giving the, the animals um, meat, that researchers gave them cocaine, instead of being dogs, they gave them rats, and they also used an auditory tone. And instead of looking at saliva, they look at dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. And these green animals have been exposed to just auditory cues, and then they come into the experiment to do the voltammetric analysis, and nothing happens. The auditory stimuli does not rise dopamine. But the purple animals in whom every time they got cocaine, they were paired with the sound. When they are brought into the laboratory and they measure dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, but they only give them the sound, no cocaine. What the investigators found was that dopamine goes up by itself. The cue, and think about it, because this is going to be fundamental into the questions, are we in control with ourselves or not? The reality is that the cue now is raising dopamine. And the magnitude of that raise in dopamine predicts how much the animal is motivated to go on and, and, and actually work for, for the cocaine in this case, or work for the food in the other one. Does this happen in humans? Well, using the same methodology, uh, we and others at John Hopkins actually did a very similar experiment where we took uh, cocaine abusers, brought them into the laboratory. These were active cocaine abusers. We did not give them any drug. We just actually exposed them on the one condition to neutral cues, um, a video of nature scenes. And on another day, we exposed them to a video that showed individuals preparing to consume and consuming cocaine that was actually tailored for the way that they administer the drug. And we measure raclopride. And these are the results, the actually the average data for the cocaine abusers when they watch the control video, and for the cocaine abusers where they watch the cocaine video. And you can see that there is a significant reduction in the binding of the ligand to the area where you have the dopamine D2 receptors. These are individuals, active cocaine abusers, where it's actually almost, you can know, you actually it is the changes produced by the consumption of the drug itself are indistinguishable from placebo. And yet the cues can increase dopamine in these um, striatal regions. And what we also showed was that the magnitude of the changes uh, in dopamine produced by the cue was directly associated with a subjective perception of craving for the drug. In other words, the stronger the dopaminergic response to the cue, the greater the craving for the drug in these cocaine abusers. And this is probably one of the most fundamental aspects that relates to the loss of control in the person that's addicted to cocaine, because they, it is the cue that drives them the motivation to actually go after and take the, the cocaine. 
Imagine if it was just taking the cocaine itself, uh, they would, what would drive them to want to take the cocaine? There needs to be a signal that says do it. And that's what the conditioned cues are doing. What about food? Food is exactly the same thing. And we did these experiments also many years ago. And we investigated individuals when they were tested with neutral uh, situations with raclopride. These are healthy controls. And then when they were exposed to videos of very appealing food, to cues. And actually, the, the, the food videos, the food uh, videos were um, tailored to what the subjects actually particularly like. And we show that just as we had seen for the cocaine cues, the food cues actually increase dopamine in the human brain. And the magnitude of the increases here, in this case, for food were associated with a subjective perception of hunger and desire for food. Again, this is a mechanism that makes enormous physiological sense. Because once you've been conditioned, once you learn that a certain food has energy and is rewarding, then it is in the best interest of biology to activate the dopaminergic system before you eat it. Because otherwise, again, you are not going to be motivated to go and kill the creature that you need to kill in order to eat it. You don't, in, in the past, this mechanism didn't emerge when we have refrigerators. You need to have that drive to want to do those behaviors. If the dopamine went up when you ate it, first of all, the likelihood that you will find the food would be much lower. But also, at that point, it's inconsequential because you've already consumed the nutrients that are required for you to survive. So this Q association is a mechanism that actually maximizes the likelihood that we all are motivated to do behaviors that are actually, we've learned in the past, are going to be uh, potentially successful in achieving what we want to do. Now, when we're dealing with the concept of obesity or the concept of addiction, one of the questions that we always ask, and I am very much apropos of win question, uh, are we in control or are we not in control? And the reality is many of these mechanisms, these condition responses are unconscious. We don't regulate them. They happen whether we want it or not. The reward, the way that our body responds to a reward is not something that we, we control. It's basically happening almost in an uh, automatic response. But on the other hand, we have this gigantic cortical mantle, and in particular, the frontal cortex that has, uh, that has developed by uh, evolutionary at the greatest extent in human primates, and that actually it has very strong connections to these limbic areas and reward centers. And it is through this cortical mantle that we can actually predict uh, situations and try to control them. We can predict that something may happen, and we can try to change our behaviors accordingly. So this is the famous uh, frontal cortex, uh, which has been the, one of the key, key orchestrators of what we call executive function. And executive function are the processes that we actually allow us to exert some level of self-control, self-regulation, decision-making. So we're not just out there with nothing um, targeting, targeting, actually guiding, guiding our behavior that is independent of us. The frontal cortex plays that role. So the question is why then actually are people that are addicted to drugs, here you have, and they have a frontal cortex, we all are born with a frontal cortex, and they know that if they take the drug, they are going to end up in prison or they may lose the custody of their children. Why is it that they cannot use their frontal cortex to say, okay, I'm going to avoid being in those situations. I'm going to avoid actually being having that drug so I don't take it because then that becomes an automatic behavior. Why don't they use their frontal cortex for that purpose? And in order for the frontal cortex, again, it's another issue that we don't, that we always give for granted, but the frontal cortex, uh, functions better in some people than in other. And there are certain insults that can damage the function of the frontal cortex. And one of the neurotransmitters, again, uh, fundamental for the proper function of the, the frontal cortex is the dopamine system. So if you are taking drugs, then the question that follow, uh, are you changing the dopamine system in ways that it would interfere with the function of the frontal cortex? 
So we've done a series of studies that uh, to address this question, both for addiction and in obesity. And what we have shown, and then many others have uh, shown and replicated and corroborated, both in humans and in animals, is that in individuals uh, that are addicted to a wide var variety of drugs, cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, heroin, nicotine, consistently we've observed, and others, a decrease in the levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the human brain. And this was, again, a very interesting concept because it actually documented what Wynne was saying, that in addiction, there is a very specific uh, phenotype uh, in the brain that makes you actually um, changes the biochemistry in ways that can be said that, uh, that had led to actually provide the evidence that addiction is a disease of the brain. So the concept is how do decreases in dopamine D2 receptors actually engage in the addiction process? Well, I can tell you the following, and the data is not there. Not every addicted person has low levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And guess what? There are people that are not addicted to drugs who have low levels of dopamine D2 receptors. This data, in average, consistently, you take a group of addicted and non-addicted, and consistently, the group has lower levels. But there are outliers. And because there are outliers, that means that you cannot equate low levels of dopamine D2 receptor equals addiction. Because then that means that every person that's normal with low levels of D2 receptors would be addicted, and that's not the case. So what does it mean? So in order to understand this, we actually translated these findings of decreases in dopamine D2 receptors in humans and said, what about if we work with animal models of addiction and then do through genetic um, treatment, upregulate the levels of dopamine D2 receptors? What happens to the addictive behaviors? And we've done these studies and actually um, we've done three independent studies. Uh, Peter Thanos was leading this investigation at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, two of the studies were done in alcohol and in animal models of alcohol consumption. One was done in spractoly rats and the other one was done in preferring and non-preferring rats. And across these three different strains, the effects are the same. And he also did it in uh, the same animal model for cocaine addiction. And since the effects are all the same, whether it's one strain or the other, or, or alcohol and cocaine. I'm just showing the first of these series of studies. And what he did, Peter, was um, made animals compulsively administer alcohol. And when they had, were happily administering alcohol, he then injected them with an adenovirus inside of which was the D2 receptor gene. This was a strategy done to increase dopamine D2 receptors. It's a gene treatment. And effectively, uh, when you inject them with this adenovirus inside which you have the gene, you increase the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. So this is four days after the adenoviral injector. It is uh, short-lasting, and the uh, D2 receptors go back to baseline around day 10. You can inject again, and the receptors go up. And then you can ask the question, well, under these conditions, what happens to the drinking behavior? And what we've been observing, again, across all of the strains or with cocaine, is that when you upregulate D2 receptors in the rat models, in these rat models, you significantly attenuate the consumption of the drugs, alcohol or cocaine. And this is attenuated as long as the receptors are elevated. When the receptors go back to baseline, the animal starts to consume high quantities of drugs again. And in this case, it returns back to baseline around here, more or less, and then you actually inject again the adenovirus and again, the drinking behavior goes down. And this is just an animal that was uh, injected with the adenovirus but with no gene to control for nonspecific effects, indicating that upregulation of D2 receptors prevents against the consumption of high quantities of drugs, whether it is alcohol or cocaine. And interestingly, now many investigators have gone into looking at this, and this is again a very consistent finding. In any animal model, using whichever strategy you want, in this case, we were using these genes, but you can manipulate how well that D2 receptor works. You can make it more efficient or you can make it less efficient. If you make the a D2 receptor more efficient, you decrease uh, the rewarding effects of drugs. But on the other hand, if you decrease the efficiency of the D2 receptor system, then what you do is you enhance the rewarding effects of drugs. And we now know that D2 receptors are necessary for us to self-regulate. 
And when you don't have them, you're much more impulsive and you're much more likely to be compulsive when those receptors are down. So we now know from the behavioral presentation of having low levels of D2 receptors that actually that facilitates impulsivity and compulsivity. And the question is how does the D2 receptor does that? And I'll get into it in a second. We've done exactly the same thing with obese individuals. And this is another very interesting commonality in terms of the pattern of abnormalities that we observe in this, in this case, morbidly obese individuals, that just like we had seen in addicted individuals, they show significant reductions in the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And in the obese objects, this is their body mass index, in greens are the obese, the uh, lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the more severe the phenotype. And again, why? Well, I already hinted you, low levels of D2 receptors is going to facilitate the emergence of compulsive behaviors. And so this is likely to be one of the mechanisms by which you see this association. And we've gone also to investigate it in an animal model of obesity, where we actually are working with um, the uh, ob lean and obese rats uh, that, uh, in which we measure dopamine D2 receptors using spiperon and uh, autoradiography. We have also observed a significant relationship, negative relationship between the body mass index of these creatures and the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. The higher the weight of these animals, the lower the levels of D2 receptors, whereas the lean animals, and, and these are actually controlled for genotype, gen genotype background, the lean animals have significantly higher levels of dopamine D2 receptors. Why? Why, can, why is it that low levels of dopamine D2 receptors are producing this propensity for compulsive behaviors and impulsivity? And why is it that low levels of dopamine D2 receptor enhance rewarding effects of drugs? Well, we've been studying in all of our subjects, both brain glucose metabolism and dopamine D2 receptors, and the same thing in obese individuals. So we can now actually ask the question, if you have low levels of dopamine D2 receptor in the striatum, how does that influence the function of the brain? And what we have seen, again, consistently in cocaine abusers, in alcoholics, and methamphetamine abusers, is that the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the metabolic activity in the frontal areas of the brain that are necessary for executive function. And this is a very, very strong effect, you said in, again, cocaine abusers, methamphetamine abusers. The lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the metabolism in prefrontal regions, most notable, the uh, orbital frontal cortex, this area of the brain that actually is the frontal area that connects to limbic brain areas, that when you damage it, interestingly, if you damage this area of the brain, you can do it in an animal model, or someone can go into an accident and damage their orbital frontal cortex. That results in a phenotype uh, with, of compulsive repetitive behaviors that are very difficult to stop. The other area is the single leg gyros, which also are uh, over here. And I'm showing you the data for the orbital frontal cortex, but the same, uh, the strong relationship occurs with the single leg gyrus. The single leg gyrus is an area of the brain that is identifying whether a stimuli and an action is correct or not and allows us to change our behavior. The orbital frontal cortex allows us to determine the value of that reinforcer as a function also of its context. So when you are satiated, the food is no longer valuable as a reinforcer. But if you're hungry, it is extremely valuable. But if you damage that area of the brain, you lose the capacity to change your behavior as a function of this changing context. And so you can start to understand, yeah, well, that makes sense. If you've damaged the orbital frontal cortex, the cocaine abuser, the alcoholic, the methamphetamine abuser is actually not going to be able to shift the preference. The drug is going to be fixated as the main reinforcer. So the question, do we observe this in obesity? And the answer is yes, exactly the same pattern of relationships. The lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptor, the less the activity on the orbital frontal cortex and the dorsal single leg gyros. And again, consistent with the notion that these areas of the brain are necessary for us to be able to shift the drive of a behavior as a function of its reinforcing value, which changes as well as identified when actually a behavior that we are doing is no longer the expected, providing the expected outcome, which is what the single age arrows will do and help us change our behavior. And the disruption of these two areas 
actually uh, can and produces that impulsivity and compulsivity that is so characteristic of obesity and addiction. So taking this information from the, the initially drug addiction world, we can now generate the same map for obesity. And we're speaking about it in terms of there is a situation that uh, the brain is a network and networks add, add, interact with one another and regulate our behaviors to maximize our survival. And these networks are actually disrupted uh, by addiction and by food. And very prominent in the disruption of these networks is the reward system because it's what motivates our actions. So any one day, in any one day, every one of us is exposed to situations where we have to make a decision. Do I do or do I not do? In some instances, it makes sense to do something that is rewarding, but in others, it's not. Something that's rewarding, we're conditioned, we want to do it. But there are certain circumstances we can say, no, wait a second, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to do it. So we are in control. That's the prefrontal cortex. But in addiction, that neurocircuitry has been disrupted. The rewarding, when you consume that drug per se, is not sensitized. But your memory systems that allow for conditioning are sensitized. So these memory systems actually send a signal to the saliency reward system to say this is very relevant. And to create a sense of need, of drive, of motivation that leads the person to want to do it, very intense desire to do that. And the prefrontal cortex has been actually disrupted by the continued exposure to drugs or perhaps by a vulnerability factor that was there to start with. And it's unable to regulate these very strong impulses. And it is that on balance between that intense drive triggered by conditioning as well as by stress, I haven't spoken about it, and the impaired function of regulation mechanisms that is unable to compensate and resolve on the automatic repetitive behaviors that can be so devastating both in addiction and obesity. And from this, we can actually go many places. This is actually just the beginning. As I was saying, the research in this whole field is blossoming on every single way, and we are being constantly surprised, even by the concept, for example, that the microbiome can actually also influence the dopamine reward system. Even by studies that are now emerging, that the microbiome can even influence the rewarding effects of drugs. So as we are plunging in actually what are the neurocircuitry and the neurotransmitters that are engaged in uh, driving our behavior for food eating, we're coming to recognize that uh, that tremendous opportunity that we have by investigating how they influence the motivation drive of being able to tailor interventions that can protect us, of course, against the adverse effects of drugs or excessive obesogenic food. But at the end of the day, as one looks into all of this and says, well, where do we go from there? And where do we, are we in control or, or are we not in control? And when I do believe that we are in control at many levels and we have the knowledge to recognize what environments may be pathological and dangerous. And certainly we understand and recognize that drugs are, can be very, very dangerous. But we also need to recognize that we can create an environment where obesogenic food is so widely available and accessible and making us conditioned that it is creating a devastating epidemic on obesity and metabolic syndrome. And I think it behooves us as thinking entities to actually uh, not just modulate and create interventions as us as individuals that can prevent us from overeating, but to create health um, policy interventions that can protect the populations from these adverse effects of very powerful rewards. Thanks very much. Well, <clears throat> so let's see, we have uh, time for a few questions and then after Kevin's talk. So maybe some of you have questions. You should ask this stellar. Wait a minute. Would you do that? Thanks. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Um, based on what you've now presented, to what extent would you say that addiction is more a failure of the cinquagyrus and 
more of a too much activity of the nucleus accumbens? It, what proportion is each one contributing to the process? I think that it's going to vary between individuals. I think that's what we are, and this is true also for other mental illnesses, that the relative contribution of one network over the other is likely to vary from person to person. And understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the child brain function is uh, important for us to try to tailor intervention. So if I have someone where there is decreased activity of the prefrontal cortex, I can do an intervention to try to strengthen it. Whereas if I have someone where there is an hypersensitized condition response, I can try to extinguish it. Um, so my question comes with the D2 receptors. You mentioned that uh, someone with low D2 receptors isn't um, an addict, but does that mean they're more susceptible to addiction? They are not an addict at all, absolutely not. What it means is that if you have low levels of dopamine D2 receptors, you are much more likely to actually fall into compulsive affective behavior. And this is uh, both for food, it's also for drugs, it has also been shown for gambling. And I, I started by saying, well, now we know, for example, one of the things is that you know, that animals that don't have leptin become obese, massively, massively obese. Interestingly, those animals have low levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the field. And giving them leptin upregulates those levels of dopamine D2 receptors. So, so far, again, highlighting how important this dopaminergic system is, is in, in enabling the ability of these peripheral modulators to actually inhibit feeling or to enhance it. So I'm curious, many years ago, a Nobel Prize was given for prefrontal lobotomy for the treatment of mental illness. Did those patients show any manifestations of metabolic irregularities of the type that you're speaking of here, or is that too long ago no, to no, know? No, 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 no. I mean, I've been very intrigued about the whole notion of the use of um, surgery for the treatment of mental illnesses. And they have been um, the most extensively studied for obsessive compulsive disorder. There were some uh, surgeries done for depression, but most of them were obsessive compulsive disorder. And there were also several studies that were done for addiction. And what was interesting in the patients with obsessive compulsive disorder is there with addiction, the phenotype of compulsive behavior, the inability to stop, even though you know it, your hands are clean, you watch and you watch, but the person that's addicted doesn't feel the, the drug as rewarding, but they cannot stop. So they they interrupted the connections that go into the logical frontal cortex. And that actually can decrease the compulsive behavior. And it also has been, has, was done in patients suffering from addiction. There have been other psychosurgeries that go as uh, destruction of the nucleus accumbens as a treatment for addiction. Oh. The problem with those uh, those surgical procedures as being discussed is that the person uh, lose their motivation and drive. Mm -hmm. So they are no longer motivated to take drugs or to do anything. So that that actually they did th those were those that type of surgery was done in China and was recently made illegal because of the consequences to the patients losing their motivation. All right. Oh, we have one other question and then there'll be time afterwards. So I was wondering if I could ask you a little bit more specific question with regarding to the D2 receptors. So there's also presynaptic D2 receptors on the VTA. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. so when you discuss, you discuss a decrease, is it decreased only in striatum? Or is that also true for the VTA? Where Ex extremely important question, and I didn't have time to go, but I was speaking about on the striatum. And the striatum is an heterogeneous creature. The ventral part where you have the nucleus accumbens and then you have the dorsal striatum. So drugs and food reward initially activate the nucleus accumbens and when you get uh, repeatedly exposed to them, you start to actually send the, the signaling to the dorsal striatum and that's what creates a habit. So the moving from the ventral to the dorsal generates a habit. But the concentration of dopamine receptors in the striatum varies. So in the nucleus accumbens, you have D1, D2, D3. D3. D2 and D3 are very, very high. And raclopride cannot distinguish between D2 and D3. In the dorsal striatum, it's predominantly a D2 receptor. So we now know, and I speak about dopamine increasing 
drugs increasing dopamine in the nucleus accumbens to be rewarding? I should say, for drugs to be rewarding, they have to increase dopamine and stimulate D1 receptors, not D2 receptors. D2 receptors, if anything, are going to interfere with reward. But I didn't have time, so I was actually presenting the whole message. So you increase dopamine, and you basically stimulate these different types of receptors. D1 receptors are the ones that's necessary for reward, and they are necessary for this conditioning. All right, thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to share the stage with Nora, which is uh, intimidating giving a talk after Nora Volko. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to describe some of our work on uh, regulation of body weight and, and dynamics of body weight, and towards the end, try to tie into some of the uh, uh, the, uh, the discussion that, uh, that Nora started uh, or uh, did with, uh, with respect to obesity. But my lab has been um, primarily interested in trying to better understand the regulation of human body weight, and in particular, try to quantify the relative role of feedback circuits that um, regulate uh, calorie intake and calorie expenditure in humans. And um, in particular, uh, you know, hormones that we've been discussed already, things like leptin, as well as many other factors that circulate in the blood that uh, tell the brain how much stored energy is available. And how does that impact calorie intake and calorie expenditure? And what I'll focus on in the first part of the talk is more what I would think of as more about the homeostatic regulation of those processes. And then towards the end, we'll focus on how that links up with some of the hedonics and the cues in our environment and, and uh, how that can influence these things. Um, but in particular, um, you, you may have noted that my background was in physics, and I'm particularly interested in quantifying these relative factors, and in fact, the strengths of these, uh, of these various feedback circuits, and better understanding what role each of them have in determining how body weight is regulated, what's the relative influence of regulation of calorie expenditure versus calorie intake in determining um, our resistance to weight change. Because as we all know, if anyone who's attempted to lose some weight over a particular period of time, it's a difficult process and our body actually responds in a way to maintain the current body weight or the uh, possibly even the highest body weight that we've ever uh, had in the past. And so uh, the way that one quantifies a system with multiple negative feedback loops is that you have to perturb the system in some way, kick it, and see how the system responds. And throughout decades, many, many people have done controlled feeding experiments where they will uh, cut calorie intake by a known amount and measure to see uh, how body weight and body fat change over time and how calorie expenditure reacts to those changes in body composition as well as the changes in calorie intake itself. In fact, there have been so many of those kinds of studies done in the past that we have a pretty good idea of how that sort of thing works. Uh, enough for my group to make uh, some uh, mathematical models of those processes that will actually uh, predict, if you know uh, the changes in food intake and physical activity, um, how uh, metabolism will change, the number of calories the body's burning both at rest and throughout the day, and make predictions about uh, body weight and body fat changes, the composition of the body over time. We've published several papers on this um, over the years, uh, one in The Lancet in particular. And in fact, if folks are interested in playing around with a model like that, uh, we uh, put something online called the NIH Body Weight Planner, where you can enter in some uh, demographic information, uh, information about what one's goal weight might be over a particular time frame, and changes in physical activity that you're interested in making, and it will tell you what calorie level you would have to target in order to both reach your goal weight and maintain that over time. This little tool has now been used by more than a couple million people, um, and, and I think it's, 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 an interesting, uh, it's an interesting tool, and I encourage you to play with it. Um, but I'm not going to focus too much on that. I'm going to focus on some extreme cases of what happens when people are actually extraordinarily successful, at least in the short term, uh, of losing tremendous amounts of weight through lifestyle changes alone. And so we did, conducted a study of the uh, Biggest Loser contestants, so folks on this reality television show called The Biggest Loser, who over an abbreviated period of time, approximately seven months, lose hundreds of pounds of body weight through a combination of intense exercise, and uh, extreme cutting of calories. This is the winner of the season that we studied. This is Danny Cahill. He started off at 430 pounds. And after seven months, he lost about 240 pounds, uh, reaching 191 pounds at the end of this seven-month period. 
Um, and so what we were interested in is because these folks actually engage in a, an enormous amount of physical exercise, was whether or not these folks are actually able to prevent the normal slowing of metabolism that occurs when people simply cut the calorie intake of your diet. Folks who've read fitness and health magazines probably have noticed claims that if you just did resistance exercise training, you wouldn't experience a drop in metabolism, and that'll facilitate your weight loss and help you uh, from, from regaining body weight. Um, and the data behind those claims have been you know, not necessarily the best. And so we wanted to test this in this particular population as well as look at what was actually undergoing, how, what was happening underlying these dramatic weight changes in these folks engaged in this lifestyle uh, intervention. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the show, it's basically a reality television show. These folks go to this ranch in uh, Malibu, California, where they essentially self-select their diet. Um, they know it's a weight loss competition, so obviously they're eating very few calories. And they undergo um, strenuous physical exercise more than three hours a day at seven days a week. And uh, what I'm plotting here are the data points as well as mathematical model simulations from that model I just shared with you uh, of body weight and uh, fat mass changes over the period of this competition. So for the first 13 weeks, these folks are isolated on this ranch. Um, they lose weight at a rate of a pound a day on average. Pound a day for 13 weeks, that's uh, amazing to me. Um, and then for those of you who aren't familiar with the show, there's a period at the end where they basically go home um, and they're instructed to just basically keep it up and you'll be returning to Los Angeles for the finale and your final weigh-in. And um, not surprisingly, once they go back to their regular life, they are not able to com uh, complete that one pound a day of average weight loss that falls to a, a meager half pound a day, which is uh, still pretty darn impressive for the remainder of that seven month competition. And uh, the mathematical model here was, uh, was uh, basically uh, accurately accounting for the fact that these folks um, were able to preserve their lean tissue mass to an extraordinary extent. Um, so these folks lose um, more than 80% of their weight comes from fat mass. Just by comparison, um, you might be familiar with some of the surgeries for uh, weight loss, uh, Ruan Y gastric bypass surgery being one of the most well studied. Folks who lose a similar amount of weight over an uh, even longer time frame um, with those kinds of surgeries, um, basically a third or more of their weight loss is coming from lean tissue loss or, or fat-free mass loss. And so this exercise component seems to be doing its job in preventing the loss of fat-free mass. Um, and so what's happening um, in terms of calorie expenditure? We used a method called the doubly labeled water method to measure total calorie expenditure um, in an objective way in these folks. And before that, they knew that they were actually uh, contestants in the competition. We tested them in their uh, habitual environment at home, and they were burning about 3,700 calories a day. And these are sedentary people. They're not doing exercise. Okay, So they're actually expending and, and eating to maintain that initial body weight, uh, a huge number of calories. Um, six weeks into the competition, once they'd uh, been ramping up their exercise, they were burning in excess of 4,500 calories a day. And then by the time they go home, you can see that uh, energy expenditure is lower than it was uh, to begin with. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one of them is that the amount of exercise that they were doing uh, went down when they went, went home. It was about an hour a day of, of uh, physical activity. But one of the things that people need to keep in mind is that the energy cost of physical activity in calories per day is uh, proportional to the intensity, the duration, and also your body weight. Okay. So if these folks have lost, on average, 60 kilograms by the end. So even though they're doing an hour of uh, vigorous exercise every day, the number of calories that I expend is much less than it was uh, when they were first doing that exercise on the ranch, when they were uh, actually expending uh, three hours per day uh, in, at 24 hour, uh, over um, seven days a week um, uh, to, to do this exercise. So a huge amount of exercise added for these folks. Um, their fall in metabolic rate, which was the, the thing that was supposed to be prevented from falling as a result of this intensive exercise program, actually uh, still fell by a huge amount, uh, roughly 800 calories a day of reduction of energy expenditure um, due, to, uh, due to just being at rest. And so this fall of metabolism that took place um, was not prevented. In fact, I'll, I'll show you some data once we normalized for the body composition changes, it was actually much greater than would be expected based on the weight changes themselves. 
Um, and why did they, were they able to lose so much weight? Well, the main thing that was driving this was not the exercise, but the reductions in calorie intake. Um, they actually reduced to about 1,300 calories a day during their time on the ranch, and that bumped up slightly to about 1,900 calories a day uh, when they went home. So a huge amount of this imbalance between calorie intake and calorie expenditure was due to uh, the uh, cut in calories, and then a substantial fraction, much more than is typical, is due to uh, the increase in physical activity energy expenditure. But one of the things I want to focus on next is this metabolic rate, because we have pretty much no control, no conscious control over our metabolic rate. And so what were the factors that were determining that? <clears throat> As I alluded to before, one of the main determinants, and we've known this for, for decades, is the, uh, the fat-free component of the body. So the lean tissues of the body are the most metabolically active tissues. Fat is very uh, metabolically inert in that sense. It doesn't burn very many calories to keep your fat tissue around. And so um, the resting metabolic rate is, is proportional to the amount of fat-free mass in the body. And we saw that uh, that was true in these Biggest Loser contestants. This happens to be the, the data from those 16 subjects and the best fit uh, linear regression line. Uh, importantly, the slope of that line is, is exactly what you would see in um, almost any group of folks that you would take a look at. So it's you know, roughly 20 uh, to 30 kilocalories per day for every kilo change in fat-free mass. And so one of the predictions would be if I took this person and made them lose weight and lose fat-free mass, that they should fall along the regression line and therefore have a proportionate decrease in the number of calories that they were burning. Um, and if anyone falls below that regression line or the slope is much greater than that, then they're experiencing a greater than expected change in, in metabolic rate. And in fact, this is what would happened to all those individuals as they lost weight. And this is uh, at the end of the competition in open circles and the beginning of the competition in the black circles. And you can see that that individual fell far below uh, the, um, the uh, regression line. And the difference between the predicted and the observed metabolic rate is something we call metabolic adaptation. So once you've accounted for the weight and the composition of the weight loss, did these folks experience metabolic slowing? And the answer was yes, and certainly that this extent of physical activity did not uh, prevent that degree of metabolic slowing. So people have observed this in the past, never to the same magnitude as we observed it in these uh, Biggest Loser subjects, probably because folks in the past had not measured such extreme and rapid amounts of weight loss. But one of the predictions was that this slowing of metabolism and the decrease in the number of calories that the body was burning would both be um, prevent weight loss, because you're burning less calories, you would predict that there would be a correlation such that those who experienced the greatest metabolic adaptation would have lost the least amount of weight. And furthermore, that those who experienced the greatest amount of metabolic adaptation or slowing of metabolism would be most susceptible to weight regain. Well, even in that, that uh, study in, that we published in JCEM, we actually noted an inverse uh, of that prediction. In fact, it was the folks who lost the most weight who experienced the greatest metabolic adaptation. So that's interesting, and we'll keep that in mind. It's a little bit, it was a little bit of a conundrum, and it mm. remains somewhat of a conundrum, although we have a, a potential hypothesis for why that might be. Um, to address the second question about whether or not the people with the greatest slowing of metabolism were the ones who uh, were most prone to weight regain, we followed up with these folks six years later, and here's the uh, photo of uh, Danny Cahill, who was the winner of that uh, that Biggest Loser competition, and just by inspection, you can see that he has regained a substantial amount of the weight that he's lost. This was a subject of a New York Times article back in May, um, which uh, generated a, a more media response than uh, I was prepared to handle, <laughs> let's just say that. But uh, let me walk you through some of the results here. So here, now I'm plotting at the end of the 30-week competition, the body weight and body fat changes that were observed in each individual, as well as the mean changes. And you can see that after six years, all but one person had regained some of the weight that they'd lost. Um, on average, they'd regained about two-thirds of the weight that they'd lost, the vast majority of it, again, being fat mass. So most of the weight changes are coming from fat mass changes. Um, so something to keep in mind, however, is that the, uh, they're still about 12% below where they started. 
which actually, even though it seems like a failure, and that's the kind of the way that the media described the study as the fact that they'd regained two thirds of their lost weight, if you compare that to something like the look ahead study or some uh, other lifestyle based intervention program for weight loss, 12% weight loss after six years is extraordinarily good. Um, so it looks like a failure only because they were so successful after seven months, not necessarily because of the six year time point. So I just want to keep that in mind. Um, the interesting fact and the fact that the thing that we actually still don't have a good explanation for is the fact that resting metabolic rate, despite them regaining two thirds of the lost weight, remained basically where it was at the end of the competition at that very suppressed amount. I think that's a very interesting finding. Um, we'd expected that it might still be lower, but because they'd regained some of the weight of which some of that was fat free mass that it would have increased a little bit. Um, and in fact, it stayed basically where it was if anything went down. And if you actually correct for those body composition changes, as I mentioned before, this metabolic adaptation actually increased over time. But it also allowed us then, remember the question was, were the folks who experienced the greatest metabolic adaptation um, after the weight loss competition, were those the ones who experienced the most amount of weight regain? And the answer to that was no, there was actually no correlation whatsoever between those uh, variables. Um, and I mentioned that it was actually the folks who experienced the greatest metabolic adaptation during the competition that experienced the greatest weight loss during the competition. And furthermore, it was the people who experience, continue to experience the greatest metabolic adaptation six years later that are the most successful at maintaining the weight loss. So that's very interesting. And it, it suggests to us, it's somewhat encouraging, that in fact we may have some control over this process. And it's what I call the spring model of metabolic adaptation. That metabolic adaptation, the slowing of metabolism is a response to whatever contemporaneous efforts we're making to intervene to reduce our weight. So if we're doing nothing and we're habitually staying at our, at our current weight, which is at a high level, uh, then there'll be no tension on this spring. You're not pulling it to lose weight and you're not experiencing any rebound. The more you pull on that spring, say by dieting, the greater the pullback. It's proportional to the amount that you're pulling on the spring to change your body weight. And of course, the greater that you pull, the more pullback you'll experience, but the more weight you'll eventually lose. The question is, you know, how do you keep this up over long periods of time, right? And, and this is the trick that's required in order to maintain persistent weight loss. Those who aren't undergoing biggest loser style weight loss and experiencing these huge changes will experience proportionately less pullback because the spring is not being stretched as much. And that was one of the other things that I want to counter about the media portrayal. Not everybody is gonna experience 500 calories a day slowing of metabolism. That occurs only because these folks are engaging in such extreme interventions to pull the system very far from uh, what we think of as a body weight set point. <clears throat> okay, so that was the calorie expenditure side of this feedback equation. What we'd like to do is we'd like to also um, understand the quantitative effect of how uh, changes in body weight and changes in calorie expenditure influence calorie intake. And that's actually been a very difficult type of uh, study to do until recently, because you needed to be able to do two things. One is you need to be able to change calorie expenditure in a way um, to induce these weight changes, and then be able to measure the changes in energy, expend in energy intake or calorie intake in response to those weight changes and in response to the calorie expenditure changes. And I'll focus on those two topics uh, separately because we recently solved those um, in some, to some initial extent in humans, but let's focus first on how do we actually measure calorie intake in humans? And that's something that's been called the fundamental flaw of obesity research. Um, and it's a pretty major flaw. <laughs> the, the fact is, is that all of the instruments that researchers use these days, um, typical instruments like uh, diet diaries, uh, food frequency questionnaires, 24 hour recalls, um, whether or not they're electronic or not, one of the things that we know is that they don't accurately measure the number of calories that people eat, especially over long periods of time. And we need them to me measure over long periods of time because we know that uh, in free living people, day to day, people's calorie intake fluctuates hugely. And 
you need to average the fluctuation over a sufficient period of time in order to really calculate these energy balance or these calorie balance um, scenarios. And so uh, this has been a major problem. And so one of the things that we uh, hypothesized several years ago is that if we have this model that was based on controlled feeding studies, where if we know calorie intake because it's controlled in, in an inpatient setting, for example, and we can predict changes in metabolism that occur and changes in body weight and composition, maybe we can pose the inverse problem and simply measure body weight changes over time, use the same model of metabolism to calculate what the required changes in calorie intake must have been in order to generate uh, the observed changes in body weight. And of course, that was an interesting theoretical exercise, but um, until recently, we had no way to validate that. Um, but in fact, we did validate that recently. We had a, a very nice collaboration with the folks who ran uh, a study called CALORIE, which was a, a National Institutes of Aging study of calorie restriction in um, uh, 140 subjects over a two-year period. And they employed a very expensive biomarker method in order to establish the degree of calorie restriction that, was, uh, that these subjects underwent over a two-year period. And so, uh, they did this, just to give you an idea, each arrow here, they did this uh, to uh, estimate every six months what the calorie in, average calorie intake was over in these folks. Every, every one of these uh, arrows probably cost roughly $1,000 to $2,000. Um, and so uh, over the course, it was critical for this experiment to know whether or not these folks were actually restricting their calories and how much. And so they uh, underwent this... Uh, 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 these measurements. But nicely now we had body weight measurements and we simply asked uh, our collaborators from Calorie for the you know, initial height, age, sex, uh, and, and the repeated body weights of these individuals and we compared our modeling method with this very, very expensive biomarker method in an attempt to address that fundamental flaw of obesity research which was try to estimate free living uh, calorie intake over long periods of time in, in humans. And so I'll show you what we uh, came up with. Our model is depicted in the, as the blue curve and the biomarker method in the gray, uh, the gray plots here. Um, our method was within 40 calories a day at every single time point. Now there's variability um, on the inter-individual basis and this uh, paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition goes into that. But on the group level, this is extraordinarily encouraging. It means that just by measuring body weight changes over time, and we can al also incorporate physical activity changes if we have accelerometer data, we can uh, come up with uh, accurate estimates of calorie intake changes over long periods of time in free living people. So that potentially solves the first problem that I was mentioning of, of quantifying that uh, calorie intake feedback control circuit. The next question is, how do we change calorie output in a controlled way? In fact, we'd kind of like to do it in a placebo-controlled way so that people aren't consciously aware that we've increased their energy expenditure because of all of the cognitive effects that, that um, take place as a result of people knowing that you've increased the number of calories. For example, going to the gym. Um, you might say, well, just get people to exercise. Well, that's true. You can potentially get people to increase the number of calories they burn um, but sometimes you don't because sometimes they lay on the couch after they do the exercise and are not as active to, uh, in non-exercise periods as they were to begin with. But more importantly for estimating the, uh, the calorie intake uh, circuit, uh, they might either reward themselves for exercising by eating something uh, palatable or they might say, I'm not going to ruin my exercise by eating that palatable thing. And, and, uh, and, and uh, therefore decrease their calorie intake. The variability in the response to exercise in terms of body weight is hugely variable, and we want to avoid that. Um, so we wanted to do a placebo-controlled way to increase calorie output. And the way that we did that was a little bit of a trick. There's a new class of uh, type 2 diabetes medications called sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors. What they do is essentially very specifically target the kidneys and increase the amount of glucose that's spilled in the urine. And you can increase uh, that amount by a substantial uh, fraction. In fact, about 90 grams per day for uh, higher doses of these SGLT2 inhibitors. And you can do this in a placebo-controlled way, and people will not know that you've increased their calorie output unless, of course, they're tasting their urine to see if it's sweeter than it was before, um, which I don't think is a, is a 
is a common uh, problem. <laughs> but the question is, if we give these SGLT2 inhibitors to people, can we measure their body weight changes and thereby their changes in calorie intake over long periods of time and finally quantify the strength of this feedback control circuit um, that's regulating calorie intake in humans? And so we did that. Uh, well, we didn't do that experiment. Our colleagues at uh, Johnson & Johnson had done that experiment and shared this data with us. And uh, here are the data for 153 adults with type 2 diabetes treated with uh, one of these SGLT2 inhibitors. And they lose weight, and they plateau roughly after a year or so. And the, one of the questions is, did they lose as much weight as would be predicted based on that increase in the glucose uh, calories spilled in the urine? And the answer is nowhere near as much weight as would be predicted. And that means that they must have compensatorily increased their calorie intake uh, to adjust for that. And we used our model to quantify that. And this is what the energy intake changes look like in these folks. Um, and they were increasing their energy intake by about 100 calories per day for every kilogram of weight that they lost. Uh, just to compare that with what was happening in the uh, energy expenditure side of the equation, that was roughly 20 to 30 calories per day for every kilo of weight loss. So what that's telling us is that the strength of the feedback control circuit for calorie intake is actually quantitatively much stronger than uh, the feedback control of calorie expenditure and is probably the main driver behind why it's so difficult to lose weight and keep it off. And let me explain why that might be. So what we're really interested in understanding in obesity is not just weight loss, but why do people typically stop losing weight six to eight months after they institute a lifestyle intervention for weight loss? And more importantly, why do they start regaining the weight afterwards? Now, because we didn't know an, uh, enough about the calorie intake feedback control side of this equation, there'd been a, a, a typical answer to this question. And the answer to that question was, well, what happens is people go on a diet, their meta metabolism slows down, and then by six to eight months, their metabolic rate had slowed enough to match their diet so that they experienced this dramatic drop in metabolism. And we know that that occurs to some extent. And that now that their met metabolic rate is so low and they're not getting any more bang for their dieting buck, they're going to start to lose adherence after that six to eight month time frame. And so the question that we asked was, is that, does that explanation hold water when we analyze these data with our mathematical model that incorporates both the metabolic slowing and uh, the, the, the regulation of calorie intake? And so here are the curves for calorie intake in blue and calorie expenditure in orange that underlie that body weight trajectory, the mean body weight trajectory I just mentioned. And it does not correspond to that explanation. What people tend to do really well is very early on cut a lot of calories from their diet. And metabolic rate does slow down. That's that orange curve. But by the time those two curves cross, that's the point at which that plateau occurred. That's the point where they're reestablished calorie balance. And by that point, they've experienced this exponential decay of diet adherence. Right? They're basically 80% of the way back up to where they started, which is this uh, dotted gray line, uh, horizontal gray line. And by that point thereafter, they're only increasing and going back up to where they started. And that's what's generating the very slow weight regain process. At least that's what our model is suggesting. And we'd like to better understand this in terms of the energy intake feedback control mechanism. Because if you haven't lost any weight, then your feedback circuit hasn't actually kicked in yet. But once you've lost that weight, at that 100 calorie per day per kilogram of weight loss, that's increasing your appetite. Um, and that's what's depicted in the dashed curve. If we just looked at the weight change and we use that 100 calorie per day increase in appetite uh, that was observed in the, in the SGLT2 inhibitor patients, how much do these folks want to be eating is the dashed curve. It's above baseline. They've lost weight. They don't just want to be eating what they used to be eating. They want to be eating above baseline. And so now the interesting point is that the difference between the dash curve, which is what they want to be eating, and the actual calorie intake, which is the solid line, we like to think of that as the perceived effort to be on the diet. Because one of the things I didn't mention to you is if you ask people one month into their program using some of those uh, instruments I mentioned, diet histories and whatnot, how many calories they're eating, and 12 months into the program, 
uh, they'll say they're eating the same thing. The thing that was successful at causing the rapid weight loss at month one is just now all of a sudden failed at, uh, at 12 months for some reason. That's what generated people in the past to think it was all about metabolic slowing. But in fact, the difference between the increased appetite and the actual calorie intake is actually quite constant for that first 12 months. So perhaps those self-reported measures of calorie intake aren't really, and we know this, aren't really measures of calorie intake at all, but there are measures of how much effort people are putting into trying to stick to their diet. And they're fighting an ever-increasing battle as a result of the weight loss itself, increasing the homeostatic drive to eat and increasing your appetite. So just to sum up, we have this, this, this model of, of calorie intake and calorie expenditure feedback control and how both uh, of these variables are, are intimately related with each other and involved in this circuit. And you can think of this as more the homeostatic mechanisms that are, that are enabling people or, or disabling people from losing and, and maintaining weight loss. But one of the questions that that inevitably raises is, you know, how does this explain the rise in obesity prevalence, right? If we're regulating body weight in this particular way, how is it that we've increased average body weight over time? And I don't have a definitive answer for that question, but the way I like to think about it is I can plot those two curves in a sort of geometric space and the place where they intersect is the place where this homeostatic system is regulating body weight. And there's nothing to say that, um, that those curves are fixed, right? The energy expenditure curve could be influenced by the physical activity environment. Um, you can change the amount of exercise one has to do or physical activity one has to do as part of your job and that will change the slope and the, the placement of the energy expenditure curve. Uh, the, the food environment, obviously, by all of these cues, could potentially change um, the, where that energy intake curve is located. And so, in fact, um, some of uh, Hans-Rudi Bertud's uh, thinking on this, on this uh, system is saying that, you know, it's probably a mistake to think of this homeostatic and hedonic dichotomy of what I've been talking mostly about, which is on the, the left-hand side of this, of this uh, diagram of of how fat mass and body composition and changes in those things are, 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 are controlled. It's probably more important to think of a more integrative model. Where, and Nora's talk mentioned how uh, things like uh, leptin and insulin influence dopamine um, secretion and, and regulation. And, and similarly, in the reverse direction, it's not unthinkable that, uh, that these hedonic properties and food cues in the environment influence how uh, the homeostatic system regulates. And in fact, one could think perhaps that the changes in the hedonic food environment are slowly shifting the energy intake uh, curve to the right or upwards. Um, and we are defending higher body weights as a result of this interaction. And we're only beginning to understand this interaction. And uh, that's going to be the focus of some of our work in the future. So with that, I'd just like to thank the whole host of folks who've helped with this stuff and happy to take some questions. Thank you, Kevin. That was very exciting. So we have time for plenty of questions and discussion. Uh, hi, Kevin. Very nice. Hi. Uh, you uh, didn't distinguish between types of caloric intake, whether it's in carbohydrates, fats, proteins, wouldn't that make a big difference? That's, that's another talk. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun because most of our actual, very much of our research has been involved around making isocaloric changes in carbohydrate and fat in the diet and trying to better understand, does that energy expenditure curve, is that influenced very much by um, the, the content of the diet? And, the short answer is that um, if it does change, it's by a very, very small amount, probably physiologically negligible amount between dietary carbohydrate and fat, although there are people selling books these days that will vehemently disagree with me on that point. Um, and, and, uh, but we don't know very much about the, the calorie intake side. Uh, if we've done, um, we've done uh, studies where we control the diet specifically and don't allow them to self-select. And so one of the open questions is whether or not if the composition of the diet that are being 
queued and are being presented to people, how does that change the regulation of energy intake? And we simply don't know the answer to that question yet. So well, we, I have a question with regard to that. There's sort of a popular lore that foods that, not foods, but what you eat before you have the main meal, what my grandmother used to call noshing, uh, <laughs> uh, nachos, tacos, and uh -huh. all of that. Now, do they have something in them <coughs> that stimulates the appetite? It certainly can't just be the dried... Uh, <laughs> Uh, potato cracker. Is there something that's added to these widely consumed popular uh, foods that stimulate the appetite? How does that work? I'm, I'm sure Nora knows a lot more about this, but um, there's, uh, uh, you wanna... there's some really fascinating books that have been popular books that help, help to try to address that question. One is um, Salt, Sugar, Fat and combinations of these nutrients that seem to stimulate appetite and, and how people have come up with ingenious ways of changing the foods that uh, are particularly in processed foods that allow us to overconsume in certain ways. Um, it's, it's a fascinating question, and I think that there's also this issue of, of, of sensory-specific satiety, the fact that you can have dessert even though you're full, and you wouldn't want to add another steak but you would be perfectly happy to consume you know, an ice cream sundae with the same calories as that steak after consuming the steak in the first place, um, which I think is, is particularly interesting and relevant to your question. It's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, one of the, the things, and, and this is, uh, has been shown actually in, in animals, that you can have them eat a huge quantity of calories just by giving them fat or, or fat combined with sugar, fat with salt. But there's a paper that just came actually out. I mean, that, those studies show that, the, uh, that this behavior is happening with these obesogenic foods. But the issue is what is the mechanism? And there's a very illuminating paper that just got published a couple of weeks ago or this week in which they actually asked that question, not for obesogenic food, but for alcohol, where people take their aperitif before <coughs> actually eating, and that increases their food intake. And what they show is that alcohol increases the release of a guti-related peptide. And a guti-related peptide is a peptide that is liberated when you are in a state of starvation that leads you to want to eat excessively. So in the case of alcohol, it has been shown it would be very interesting to see the extent to which certain foods may have that ability or whether they are actually going directly at the reward system in a way that you become conditioned. And when you become conditioned, you just want more and more and more and more of the same, same thing. But we don't understand the mechanism. What was the peptide? A guti-related a peptide. That's the peptide that actually makes these um, animals jello because it's actually uh, involved in, in the, the coloring of the skin. But it's also involved, a guti is involved with the actually the enhancement of food when you are under a condition of starvation. So if you food deprive an animal, the agouti uh, cells, which are in the, um, the uh, in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, get activated and they inhibit the oxytocin neurons on the paraventricular hippocampus and that generates this hyperdrive of overeating. Wow. <laughs> I think, Myra, you have a question? Just a question, a question about how someone trained in a physicist and a psychiatrist end up in, in this particular area of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a series of happy accidents, I guess. Um, Basically, the very short story is I, I, I was already transitioning sort of to physiology in my physics degree by studying cardiac arrhythmias and try to better understand how to model different arrhythmias and control them. I realized that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I didn't actually want to do a postdoc either, so I went to industry for several years, and the first thing they said was, we want you to build a computer simulation model of type 2 diabetes. So that's how I got interested in endocrinology metabolism. And then fortunately, people took a chance on me here as a tenure track. So. 
Mine was we were engaged on doing these studies on addiction, and we were seeing that in all of the addicted people consistently, whether it was uh, cocaine, alcohol, or heroin, they had le low levels of dopamine D2 receptors. So in the striatum, so I was curious to know, actually, is this a function of the fact that you are consuming a chemical artificial substance, or can you generate the same reduction in dopamine D2 receptors for a stimuli that is physiological and necessary for survival? So, and, and what also was very appealing to me at that point about the issue of obesity is that the phenotype that you observe in obese individuals is actually quite similar to that of addicted people. I mean, no one wants to be obese. And there's a lot of stigma and there's a, a big price that people that are obese are paying and yet they cannot control it, which is exactly what you see with addiction. And in fact, in my view, it's in many instances harder probably even to be obese because you cannot hide it. Whereas a person that's uh, an alcoholic may be able to hide it, the obese person is not. And yet despite all of that stigma and the, the negative effects to your body, you cannot control it. Let me ask in, into that whole concept, what is driving that loss of control? So that's how I got interested actually in obesity. And from there we've been doing a whole series of, of studies that, that are trying to understand uh, similarities, but also clearly the differences between those two conditions. Yeah. Um, I was th hearing both of your talks, I was trying to figure out if there was a way to try to separate the aspects of you know, brain versus the actual physics or the actual you know, biology that underlies this calorie loss. If you look at, at groups that have anosmia, do they tend to be, in general, way less than the general population? So you have to define that for a physicist, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, no, no, no sense of smell. That's what I thought. So, so there's, there's yeah. no basically reward with regard, because you could you could think of that when you are have, mm -hmm. let's, for example, you would crave more food, you may also be sensitizing your smell, sense of smell and, and so forth. So if you don't have that feedback loop, you know, is there some evidence from the population studies that that might Do those be folks, is it just orthonasal or is it retronasal as well they don't experience? Because flavor is, of course, mostly yeah. retronasal. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know any data that have looked at BMI by comparing that condition normalized to various covariates. But it's an interesting question. No, it's fascinating, and I actually wonder uh, why I never thought of it. It's a great, great question, because uh, of the stimuli, olfaction is one of the most powerful ones to generate conditioning. And that is, in fact, one of its purposes, and we condition to people by their smell, whether we see it or not. So <coughs> it will be an uh, intriguing. I assume it's not, um, people must have looked at it, so it's a pop med, but I don't think it would be, um, I mean, if, if indeed there was a less likelihood of becoming obese, then you could actually do an intervention that removes your olfaction sense as a treatment for obesity. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Kevin, have any of your patients involved in this, particularly the huge weight loss, actually had PET scans? And uh, do they show findings similar to what? Nora was describing. Yeah, my so there's there was a couple of there were some folks at Caltech who were interested in doing this when we started the study. The problem was that these folks were so large that fitting in the scanner was a major issue, and there was such a small number of them that would actually fit that it was deemed, I believe, not worthwhile actually doing. So um, whether or not subsequently they've had that done, we certainly haven't done it. Um, and, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, no, and it was one something one something that we had to deal with at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and there Jean Jack also came up with a special <coughs> bed that will be able to support the obese individuals. And the, the pet is easy because it's a big country. It was more challenging with the MRI because it's much narrower. But one yeah. of the things that was given to the NIH was, and I thought that that camera ended up on the NIDDK, was an MR for uh, testing obese individuals, which is, of course, of interest to the industry that is producing MRs because there's an increasing population of obese people that get sick and that needs to get MRIs. So now there are MRIs for obese individuals and I predict that there is, I mean that MRI was supposed to be 
at the NIH. But I never there, inquired, do you there know are, what is that? There are a couple. The NMR Center has one for neuroimaging, although it's being decommissioned later this year, and another one will come online at some point. Uh, the NIDDK scanner is primarily used for, for mostly anatomical and NMR stuff, so um, not for functional neuroimaging. Hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for an extremely exciting presentation, and particularly to the students here and those who are listening or, or watching. This is an extraordinary example where people ostensibly coming from different directions and expertise uh, meet, discuss, have a cup of coffee together. And that's where a lot of the great progress in science comes from, not from burrowing in your own hole all the time, but uh, uh, seren welcoming serendipity. So thank you both very thank you. much again. That was really exciting.